The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. But the more that views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Catch Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know if you're Welcome back to the Curbsiders. This, of course, is a an episode where we're going to quickly recap lots of things, Paul. We're going to talk about hand pain, wrist pain, foot and ankle pain, and of course, myopathy and myositis. How are those things related? Well, it should be self-explanatory. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you doing tonight? Uh, Matt, I am as good as can be expected. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. You were just telling me how you are falling apart. <laughs> and uh, so on air, we'll say we're both doing great. No, I mean, and it's, it's that the Rona finally caught up with me. It was a good three-year run, but now I'm I'm recovering nicely, but not fully recovered. So if I don't sound like my usual bright-eyed, bushy-tailed self, we can blame that. Well, Paul, remind people, what is it that we do on this podcast? Happy to. Usually we are the, well, we're always the internal medicine podcast, Matt, but typically we use expert interviews to glue you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. This time around, we're going to recap episodes as you alluded to earlier and talk about ourselves talking about episodes uh, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so we'll recap some of our favorite pearls from, from a, a couple of episodes uh, and condense down into a high yield format that you can take away and be better people from. Well, first up, number 339, hand and wrist pain with our favorite orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Ted Parks, with production and graphics by the great Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. And Paul, the first question I had for you is, how can I differentiate between dequer veins, tenosynovitis, and and CMC joint arthritis of that that first CMC joint? You know, the patient that vaguely just presents and says, it hurts uh, here on my on my thumb, my wrist area. That's, but that, I mean, that's not vague at all. That's, I mean, you're, I feel like you're halfway there if that's what they're telling you. So I, I think, as you mentioned, sort of very common. I think we all see wrist pain in, in the office a lot. And the the big two diagnoses for pain, especially at the base of the thumb when we're talking about wrist pain here, so we can actually see it on camera, is, as you mentioned, decorvane uh, tenosynovitis uh, versus CMC arthritis. And so a lot of the times for musculoskeletal stuff, I feel like physical examination is kind of helpful, but not super helpful. This is one where the physical exam is actually really, really helpful. So Dr. Parks talked us through the Finkelstein maneuver. Um, and there are other eponyms that go along with this, but basically the long and the short of it is you had the patient take, sorry, this is right in your face, folks, take your thumb, wrap your fingers around it. And then the examiner will then just sort of point down almost like the patient's sort of trying to stab you with a knife. And if you reproduce pain that way, that is a positive Finkelstein test. And that is, um, they will tell you the patient probably has a flexor tennis and the other test, if you're looking for CMC arthritis, uh, is the CMC compression test where basically avoiding the microphone. He <laughs> talks about taking the thumb like a joystick, pushing down and just kind of moving it around like a mortar and pestle and seeing if it reproduce the pain that way. And if, if you do, congratulations, you've um, you've diagnosed them with CMC arthritis, it's, which is one of the more common spots to get arthritis just because of the way the, the, the hand is constructed. Most, most of the movement is fairly linear, flexion extension the thumb is a lot of range of motion. So unfortunately, because of that, that's the cost of probably an increased risk for arthritis and, and other joint dysfunction. Yeah, I find people either complain that like all their fingers hurt, you know, the the typical like osteoarthritis or or they just complain of just like one thumb, whatever their dominant hand is, is, yep. is a common complaint. Treatment for this, Paul, everyone's favorite, the thumb spike us thumb spike a splint, Paul. And and Paul, I should just keep people in that forever? No? Apparently not in perpetuity. There's a lot of um, <laughs> me self-disclosing the episode that I don't do a good job of counseling around bracing and splinting and that kind of stuff. But you, yeah, a couple of weeks to allow time for the inflammation to kind of calm down um, is is probably a good place to start. You don't want to do it forever because you you can lose mobility if you keep something immobile for a long period of time. Um, so right. that, the point being is you don't say, see you in three months, forget to tell them to take the splint off. That's That's bad form. And like most of the stuff we'll talk about on this episode, a steroid injection can can help here. You can, of course, try either topical or oral NSAIDs. Uh, as as we mentioned on some recent shows, Paul, I haven't. I wish I had better luck with the topical NSAIDs. I know they're kind of upfront in the guidelines now. I maybe it's the patients aren't using them often enough, or maybe it's they just don't work. I don't know, Paul, but uh, I haven't had a ton of luck, but I do try to use them at least as a first-line therapy for patients with more comorbidi comorbidities. Yeah, I run more into the price issue than anything else. I think it's hard to get them covered by insurance, at least with the plans that I'm used to dealing with, and then they, yeah. they are not inexpensive uh, for patients. So 
it's a hard sell if they're not going to give you substantial relief and you're paying out of pocket for them. So it, it can be tough sometimes. All right. Next up, Paul, the trigger finger. And Paul, uh, this is a whole hand cast is how you treat this one. Yeah, yeah, the arm, yeah, from the shoulder down, just immobilize the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the, the the pathology of this is is super neat. Like he talks sort of about these um these pulleys, which are not really pulleys, but sort of these rings that the thick and tendon can kind of get stuck on. So this idea of triggering is that the finger comes down and then you actually have to kind of physically unstick your finger if you can sometimes even feel this palpable clunk and that's triggering. It's very satisfying diagnosis to make in the office. Um, but you you don't have to brace the everything. You can actually you can just actually keep the very distal joint immobile. And there's there are specialized splints for that. I don't have access to those, unfortunately. But if you're lucky enough to be able to get them, um, that that's typically all you need. And again, sort of the same principles apply apply. It's not in perpetuity. It is for a couple of weeks, and that should be enough for things to calm down. If not, then you might need to escalate their care. What I do in the office is I just like pull up on a Google search, Google image search, uh, you know, splint, trigger finger, and then they have multiple splints that They'll prevent like uh, these joints from bending. So they'll just go over the finger there. So that way the finger can't flex and it kind of rests this spot here where people tend to get um, that that first pulley goes across here. Uh, and then there's a tendon nodule that goes up through that and gets stuck. And if you prevent them from flexing that digit, it'll prevent the triggering from happening and can rest the area. Like most other things uh, in the hand, this responds well to a steroid injection and that may even cure it. I've had a lot of patients who had a trigger finger, got a steroid injection and just went away. Um, sometimes it comes back and there is a surgery to cut that annular pulley, which then it tends to just go away and cure it. He said it doesn't, it doesn't re recur if, if that's done. So uh, that, that was one's a, pretty easy to treat, but patients do seem quite bothered by it. It's a very common yeah. complaint in my office. I, I love that, you know, not that I'll be doing any of the surgeries, but the fact that the, the common theme seemed to be you don't go after the tendons themselves. Like you actually just make space for them to kind of move and actually kind of calm down. So there's a lot of sort of snipping the supporting structures and not, not trying mm -hmm. to carve away the lump, which is the thing that makes intuitive sense. So I, I thought that was an yeah. interesting sort of theme. Now, Paul, on to carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, this one, I think... I think the pathophysiology, Paul, is a good place to start. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think it, it speaks to the treatment and, and just understanding it. Yeah. So Dr. Parks or Ted talks, talks about how nerves are extraordinarily susceptible to ischemia. They, are, they, are, they require a lot of energy to do their jobs. The ATPase pumps are sort of constantly going. And so any, any reduction in the oxygen supply to them, it, it can cause a pretty quick pathology, as opposed to things like tendons, which are, are sort of avascular right, and can, can tolerate compression, nerves just don't do as well with that kind of stuff. So it's it's just by dint of uh, what it is, it's going to be more prone to sort of compressive ischemic symptoms and sort of pathology that way, if I understand things correctly. Um, yeah. That's where he, t he talks about the carpal tunnel, which we all kind of know. There's the, what, the retinaculum, which is sort of the the fiber span that goes around and then the sort of bony tunnel that actually kind of makes the whole thing. And then so the, the treatment, if, if we're going right to surgery, sort of addresses the pathophysiology. Um, Actually, why don't, why don't we take a step back, Matt? So talk talk me through the progression of how you would actually treat carpal tunnel after you diagnose it. So you don't go right to surgery, as satisfying as that is for surgeons. But what how, <laughs> well, how does, what was well, Dr. Yeah. Park's approach? I mean, because because a lot of the ischemia occurs when the wrist is bent. You're 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 bracing the person at nighttime, to which is when people tend to sleep with their wrists bent for whatever reason. And uh, they, so they can get a lot of symptoms there. So if they wear the brace at nighttime, that can help. And then just having the patient be mindful about the, the posture of their wrist, if you will, keeping that wrist in a neutral position, that can offload it. And, uh, and that helps. So that's, that's one of the treatments. And then of course, a steroid injection, he mentioned, can be both diagnostic and therapeutic because if the patient doesn't respond to the the steroid injection at all, it probably means either uh, either you have the wrong diagnosis or you, you have to look for things like thanar wasting because if you see that, maybe the patient has just progressed too far where they're they're just not going to respond. There, th this this has been present for too long. Um, anything anything to add to the the treatment part of this? No, and I, I appreciate the point that the the treatment itself can also be diagnostic to some extent too. So th the point being is that our physical examination maneuvers for carpal tunnel specifically are notoriously horrible. So things like yeah. Phelan's and Tonell's 
um, well, are satisfying to do, don't have a lot of evidence behind them. We talked about even sort of doing the Phelan's test, which is sort of that reverse prayer. You're supposed to have the patient hold it there for like a minute, which feels like an eternity, um, <laughs> especially if it's not a particularly good test. So it, it's the the treatment itself with a steroid injection, if they have significant relief, then you know you're in the right ballpark and at least you're treating the right thing, even if that relief is transient. That That is someone who might do better with, say, surgery. Yeah, so these are like in th- these the Tanels and Phelans are are in there with Homans and Brodzinski's and Kernigs, the ones that everyone remembers them, but uh, they don't work that well. Yeah, but Weber and Renee and all the epidemics on and on and on. <laughs> well, I did want to just mention that uh, we talked a little bit about the misdiagnosis of this. That you know it should be the first two and a half fingers, so the thumb, the pointer finger, and the middle finger, the radial side, uh, and and if if you see. Uh, if you see different distributions than that, you should think maybe this is coming from somewhere else. Maybe it's a different nerve impingement. Maybe it's coming from the cervical spine, especially if it's bilateral, Paul. But if someone does truly have bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, Paul, I was reading about this and it came up in a morning report recently that that actually bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome can be a herald for later development of cardiac amyloidosis. It often precedes it by several years, which I thought was super cool and terrifying. So I'm now praying I don't find anybody with uh, with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. There are some other systemic, uh, like rheumatologic diseases, hypothyroidism, some other things that can, can cause carpal tunnel syndrome as well. Uh, but you know, amyloidosis, Paul, you know, I'm, you know, I worry about stuff like that. It, well, sure. And I would say that any listener who actually makes the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis by bilateral carpal tunnel, if you could just write into the show um, and let us know, <laughs> that would be super dupes. I think the other I think, the example, actually, that, that uh, Ted gave is actually um, jackhammer used to, by the way, which I actually oh, yeah. seen in my own practice. So you can you can get bilateral carpal tunnel just from sort of the repeated trauma of, of handling a jackhammer. So it, that's something else to be mindful of. So it's not impossible. It's just uncommon. Well, let's move on to uh, down the body, Paul, to the the foot and ankle. And this was another fantastic episode. This was with Dr. Joan Ritter. And this was, of course, again, produced and with graphics by great Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, let's start off with talking about ankle sprains. I think we are probably used to seeing these in primary care. Everyone remembers the the rice therapy, um, Give throw some NSAIDs at a person for them. But uh, what did you learn about bracing in this episode? It's like this has been a common theme for this, this, this episode that the listeners are listening to now and that you want to be a little bit careful with bracing. It can be helpful in terms of protection, but it's probably best to be able to brace in the way that preserves at least um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. If you have someone completely immobile or you put someone, say, in a boot for an ankle sprain for a prolonged period of time, they might lose proprioception um, or like they might you might impair their proprioception. And by doing so, that person might be set up for subsequent injury later on. So you, you want to be very careful in terms of the protection that you do. It's useful, but um, it should be done in a, a thoughtful and sort of conservative way and not sort of, again, bracing for someone in perpetuity, um, I think was the point that Dr. Ritter made. Yeah. And, and the, the different talking through the different types of braces a little bit, I think it's interesting to, to think about these, the stirrup brace is the one that it's usually white plastic with some green cushion inside. And that, that allows the patient to continue their, uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion at the ankle, but it, it protects them from the eversion and inversion movements that often result in a lot of the sprains. So that's a nice brace and it does allow some movement. If you put someone in one of those lace up ankle braces, that's going to control movement in multiple planes. And if you really want to immobilize somebody, uh, that would be like a walking boot. And as, as we said, you don't want to keep people in the immobilizers for too long because you want them to maintain uh, that mobility, the, the the muscle strength there, and their proprioception. Um, Paul, any any other things you want to talk about for ankle sprain before we move on to talking uh, about the Achilles? No, along the lines of sort of maintaining and preserving proprioception, I, I guess the other sort of takeaway point is to not be shy with physical therapy or at least even prescribing exercises to maintain those things. I think that's Right. I, I, oftentimes it's it's so satisfying to get to diagnosis or like, okay, if this person doesn't need imaging that you, some of the auxiliary stuff that is actually probably the most important stuff might get glossed over. So, but it's important yeah. to either prescribe exercises for the patients that you think are able to do them or even have a low threshold to send a physical therapy just to, to rehab in a way that prevents subsequent ankle injuries. Because once you injure right. it once, you're going to be prone to, to more injuries. So I thought that was also a helpful thing to emphasize. 
Yeah, and some of the stretches I, I th- we mentioned in the show notes were like you can they can ha- pretend to be tracing the letters of the alphabet with their with their toes. That'll move the ankle, stretching their Achilles. And speaking of the Achilles, Paul, you know the Achilles tendon. I heard that the Achilles tendon rupture. Tell me if I'm wrong, Paul. I might be wrong. I heard that the Achilles tendon rupture is often very subtle, and patients don't even notice it when it happens. It's I I love being set up like this, Matt. That is actually. Um... Pretty incorrect is, is my understanding. <laughs> uh, in that the Achilles, the complete Achilles tendon rupture is is often very dramatic, at least the way patients describe it. So I think uh, Dr. Ritter talks about patients may just feel like that they got kicked on the basketball court or someone actually physically attacked them. Or I think even if you read the literature, someone says they felt like they got shot in the back of the leg. Like it's it's <laughs> it's it is a discrete point in time that is dramatic and there is a pop felt is often how it is described. So if someone has a yeah. complete rupture, uh, oftentimes they know it. Um, I think that the partial tears may, may not happen as commonly, which is why you have to do the right testing to make sure that you're not missing it. Right. And you're you're alluding to this this calf squeeze test, which the eponym is the Thompson test, but it's a calf squeeze test where you, you can have the patient laying down on the table or they can have their leg uh, supported by a chair with their um with their their shin facing down, and you squeeze the calf muscle, and that that should elicit a a plantar flexion movement mm-hmm. if the Achilles is intact and you can compare both sides or you should compare both sides, Paul, right? Because I'm, I'm told that if, if you're good enough, you could even diagnose a partial tear by an asymmetry in how much each side moves when you do the squeeze test. And frankly, I think we're that good. I think we could do that. <laughs> I, have, I have faith in this. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, we, we are that good, Paul. <laughs> now, uh, the part of part of what I thought was the history of of uh, the tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, that it's kind of like plantar fasciitis, where that those first steps of the day may be really painful. I somehow had missed this, and it's the same kind of pathophysiology, right? Like at nighttime, your uh, plantar fascia is kind of tightening up because the way you're sleeping, the position your foot's in. That's why those night splints help. And the same thing happens to the Achilles. Like a lot of people, the Achilles is shortened when you're sleeping. So when you take your first steps of the day and stretch it out, it can be painful. That can be a sign of Achilles tendonitis. And for anyone who complains of like posterior heel pain, you got to think about the Achilles. And Paul, what kind of Achilles diagnoses should we be thinking about? What's I, the, the tendonitis, I mean, is the, the one, the Achilles tendonitis is the one that I would think most commonly about. So, and that's the one where um, the, a classic history would be, say, a runner who uh, increases their training or starts going up hills more often or that kind of thing. So anyone who increases, uh, I hate to say wear and tear because that's not exactly accurate, but increases sort of the, their, their movement at the Achilles, that's the patient might have sort of this gradual onset of pain. And, and so unfortunately with runners specifically, the, the counseling around what to do next is actually to stop running, which I think is, is a hard thing to counsel a lot of runners for. So that's, that's the tendonitis, if you're not worried about the complete rupture, is probably the next thing. And that one, most of the Achilles tendon injuries require a significant amount of rehab and rest. Um, and like unlike a lot of things um, in musculoskeletal stuff are not amenable to steroid injections. That's one yeah. area that you're not going to be putting steroids into because you actually can increase the risk of rupture if they haven't ruptured it already. So so don't do that. Now, Paul, what if I, what if I presented with... Uh, a burning pain on the medial side of my ankle. Maybe it goes up my leg a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, um, uh, let's say that I've gained some weight and I just have not been wearing well-supportive, sh- like shoes that have good support. And Paul, you notice that I have an acquired flat foot deformity. What what might I be, what might be going on there? No, I, I love when you pitch underhand. So this is... <laughs> <laughs> a, a diagnosis that I don't know about you, Matt, I had not thought much about or really heard much about prior to this episode, but apparently is no. common. I probably have missed it, but this is what you're describing is posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, um, which is exactly as you say, it, it happens in an older, I think it's more common in women, if I'm not mistaken, um, and weight, overweight can certainly be a risk factor for it. And sort of this burning medial ankle pain and then associated with flat foot because the posterior tibial tendon actually helps support the arch and kind of keeps things right. sort of pulled up. So if you have dysfunction of that, then you sort of lose that arch in the foot and end up with this acquired flat foot. And one of the manifestations of that is our new physical examination, uh, our new favorite physical exam sign, which is, is what, Matt? This is the too many toes sign, Paul. And how about <laughs> you tell people, that? tell people all about it, Paul. Oh, th- well, thank you for the, the chance to the too many toe sign. So like with all these things, you should have the patient take their shoes and socks off, which I think is probably the first step that many of us may potentially fail. I won't put that on you. But, <laughs> but it, and then after you do that, you actually look at the patient from behind and 
typically you should see maybe like two, two and a half toes kind of peeking out laterally there. Um, and someone who does not have um, a flat foot or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, if they do, you might see more toes than that. So more toes sort of peeking out laterally. And that is the so-called too many toes sign. And that, that points you along with these historical and uh, key points that we gave you towards the diagnosis of the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And what, what, yeah. what so say we made the diagnosis, we, we compliment the patient on how many toes that we've seen, they're mystified by the exam. Um, then what, what do we do to actually manage this? Well, Paul, this one, this one can, there, there's a lot of things. I mean, of course, NSAIDs may be part of it and some activity modification, you know, relative rest, but the orthotics to support the arch may be helpful. And again, low threshold to refer these patients to physical therapy. I was doing some more reading on this because it just, I, I wasn't that familiar with it. Apparently, if it's really bad, sometimes they'll immobilize people with either even plaster casts or a walking boot. And in really severe cases, patients may need surgery to to move the tendon somehow, Paul. So uh, definitely outside of our purview. But I think people should look out for this. And the reason we wanted to highlight on this episode is because I, I think maybe a lot of people hadn't heard of it if they're if they're yeah. like us. So with the last last section here, Paul, I wanted to move into myositis and myopathy. This was number 348 with Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein. Uh, this one was produced by me with graphics by Andrea Perdigao. And Paul, the, the thing I wanted to start off with saying is that you know, myopathy, myositis, I mean, the, there's these inflammatory myopathies. We classically thought of these as dermatomyositis and polymyositis. That's what was always taught when I was coming up in school. But now uh, the nomenclature and just the, you know, splitting these into these distinct phenotypes and subtypes has become much more sophisticated. So dermatomyositis, there's a couple different flavors of that, but that's, you know, rash and muscle weakness, um, proximal muscle weakness. But polymyositis, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Some of them overlap with rheumatologic diseases. Um, there's some autoimmune mediated necrotizing myopathy. There's a whole bunch of them, Paul, that that it's really, so it's, it's really a, a spectrum of different diseases with different prognosis and treatments. and uh, But in general, these are rare disorders. Uh, you should think of them if someone has muscle weakness and then extra muscular manifestations, which may be the skin, arthritis, interstitial lung disease, to name a few. Paul, tell me, what are some clinical features that struck you about, uh, that she taught us about in this episode? Yeah, no, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that we're not going to or at least I'm not going to be making the specific niche diagnosis um, if there's a poly, if there's a myositis there. Like I, it, I think the important part for the primary care doctor is to at least sort of recognize the broad features that that should prompt a referral to a specialist. And I think that's th things that we we talked about. I didn't quite have the the mental framework for this prior to this episode. But if you're thinking about something like myositis, this is it's predominantly weakness and fatigue. This is not typically a painful diagnosis, or I should say that you're not going to see pain in isolation. That's not going to be your presentation of myositis. You can have weakness without pain, you can have weakness with pain, but you're not going to have pain without weakness, then you're probably right. outside the realm of myositis. And then um, we, the, the great example, in terms of differentiating sort of weakness from fatigue, because I think we all see fatigue in our offices, and it's, it's a challenging diagnosis to work up at the best of times. But weakness and myositis, specifically the proximal muscle weakness, is you ask the patient, so say you were watching a movie, you're in the movie theater, you're one of those chairs, you're just kind of sunk deep down inside, and there's a fire, would you be able to kind of get out of the chair and rush to the exit? Or would you need someone to kind of physically pull you out of the chair? And if, if they, even with the place burning to the ground, if they would still need help getting out of the chair, then then you're probably more in weakness territory um, than you are necessarily in sort of overall fatigue. So I thought that was a, a really helpful way to at least sort of get those basic features kind of defined before moving on to the more niche testing and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the some of the other features we might recognize Ask about rashes, dermatomyositis, the rash is often itchy, which I found helpful. Yep. I think the uh, looking for the heliotrope rash, which can involve either uh, you know, the eyelids, uh, upper and lower, or either or, but it can, it can involve the eyelids, uh, the MCP and PIP joints of the hands. And uh, patients may have new onset Raynaud's phenomenon, that could be a clue. The scalp may be involved, and Paul, we 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 learned we know some stuff about scalp and hair loss now. And this one, if someone has per, uh, itching of the scalp and a burning pain, 
you know, you could think about dermatomyositis. And she said that that's often one of the more prominent features that the symptoms that is bothering the people most, actually, more so than the weakness is the itching, which was yeah. complete news to me. So, Paul, the, the let's talk, let's move on to the diagnostic workup a little bit here. Um, how about the physical exam? I know you're you're a big physical exam geek, so let's let's geek out on the physical exam. I do love it. I, it's, uh, increasingly, it seems less and less helpful, but I we did get some pointers <laughs> in terms of how to make sure that we're assessing for weakness appropriately and really kind of making sure that we're testing specific muscle groups. So we went over, at least in terms of talking about the neck flexors, which are important to assess with myositis, and then also the hip flexors and extensors. Um, you can be fooled. I, I don't want to say patients are trying to trick us. They just want to. They just want to do well for these examination maneuvers. And if you don't have them positioned correctly, they might recruit other muscle groups, and you're not really evaluating the muscle groups that you're hoping to. So to mitigate that, especially with the neck flexors, it's helpful to actually assess the patient while supine, uh, and that way they're not sort of using their shoulders. And you actually sort of gently hold down the forehead and ask them to push up. You're not pushing down their neck. <laughs> but, you know, you're not. You're not choking out the patient, but you're applying sufficient pressure that they have to <laughs> resist it. And then similarly. For hip flexors, you want the patient supine, um, and then actually have your foot, your your foot. You have your hand relatively close to the patient's knee, so that they're you're resisting specifically that muscle group. And then for hip extension, ideally the patient should be prone, and sort of the same thing. You want to be a little bit away from the actual joint that you're evaluating to to really um, give full resistance to that. So she gave some ways to sort of do targeted muscle strength testing, and then the grip strength mat I thought was. Um, super cool. I don't know why that one resonated so much, but to remind me what her, like, because the, the way I've been doing it, well, I think, all right, just grab my fingers as hard as you can is, is probably not the best way to do it. So how did she suggest right. doing it? So you, yeah. So she actually said just, you you flex your fingers, but you flex to the first palmer crease, which is right here. Uh, so you're just really flexing your PIP and your DIP joints. And then you're trying to pry up the fingers there. And uh, patients can't really cheat. It, it, it just really isolates those groups that you're looking for. Um, inclusion body myositis is one of the ones where she said that they, they can get distal muscle weakness. And, and so that's what you'd be looking for there. That so totally different than the way I normally test. On the labs, the lab workup is fairly standard: CBC, CMP, ANA, uh, thyroid, and inflammatory markers. the The thing that is not standard is so the ANA is often positive in the, the myositis, but anemia is uncommon, and the inflammatory markers are often normal. Which is, you know, Paul, I had no idea that that would not be what I expected. Um, right. Yeah. I think we, we talked before I, with these autoimmune diseases, I feel like you almost always see anemia. And I think that would be my expectation. And especially, and also the inflammatory markers, especially with the symptoms that these patients are having, for some reason, mentally, I would expect those things to be wildly elevated. And it turns right. out that's not the case. So you're not ruling out the diagnosis of those things come back normal. If anything, that might actually be supportive evidence. So other things you might think about, uh, MRI of the thigh muscles is sometimes used to look for uh, potential sites for biopsy and also just to identify muscle inflammation. Uh, patients could have interstitial lung disease, so getting a CAT scan of the lungs is something that can be done. And she said she actually, uh, for for the initial imaging, often does a CAT scan of the abdomen, chest, abdomen, and pelvis be, as part of just a cancer screening workup, especially if they have dermatomyositis and uh, age-appropriate cancer screening. If they're men, she'll even do PSA testing and, um, you know, testing of the pros uh, a, a prostate exam. And um, there, there are a lot of specific antibodies and muscle biopsy and things that they can use to really uh, drill down what the actual diagnosis is. But Paul, with the, the end of our time here, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we in primary care, like what is our role here? Because we gave the case we gave her was a patient who had, was on a statin. And do you remember what she said about statins and, uh, or, or why we should at least think about the statins? Yeah, a couple of things. And I, I think she blamed atorvastatin, not blamed, that's the wrong way to say it, but said atorvastatin is often implicated is probably the best way to say it, in part because that's we also tend to go high dose with that too. So you just go guns a-blazing with atorvastatin. I, I, I think she did make the point that for most patients, um, a statin re-challenge is appropriate and probably okay, And but she would start low and go slow. So rather than sort of, okay, let's just go back to 80 milligrams every single day, maybe do 20 milligrams a couple times a week, see how the patients tolerate it and not just kind of come in guns a-blazing and sort of restart at a lower level and then kind of up titrate to tolerability as opposed to right. just restarting at the prior at the prior dose that the, you had discontinued because these patients can be sensitive to the statin side effects. Yeah, and, and yes, and she, her group did discover the autoimmune, uh, this, this 
autoimmune statin myopathy that is something that exists. It's a necrotizing uh, myositis or myopathy. Uh, so her group did discuss discover that, but she she said that once that's been ruled out, uh, you can put people on statins, as you're saying, Paul. But the start low, go slow approach, which is kind of counterintuitive, um, but it's but she said you know you, you still want to protect patients from cardiac disease. Patients actually can exercise, Paul. Uh, yep. You know, they they don't necessarily need to do heavy resistance training, but they can do some exercise. That's actually been shown to be beneficial. And then in primary care, Paul, because these patients are going to be exposed to things like steroids and because they're going to be on immunosuppressive medications, you should think about getting vaccinations before those meds are started, uh, assessing their bone health, and then sun protection, Paul, especially uh, if they have some of the conditions that have photosensitive rashes they need to wear really heavy she said like spf 70 or above and you told your hat story paul where her dermatologist told you to wear a hat because your coverage up top was not not what she would want it to be for you paul she was so, very very nice and said i should consider incorporating a hat into my wardrobe <laughs> which i thought was as as, as uh, tactful as you could possibly phrase that I, I I can't disagree with that paul uh, what <laughs> it sounds like sounds like you're getting really great care yeah well yeah, not complaining you know, if people want to get deeper into any of these three episodes we've discussed tonight, they can, of course, listen to the episodes. Uh, the links will be in the show description here. We had fantastic discussions with all these guests. But, Paul, all good things must come to an end. In this episode, I think it's time for an outro. So, Paul, if you will. Let's put a bow on it. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders of bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Right. <laughs> get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. You can also email us at ask curbsiders at gmail.com. Uh, this episode is not available for CME, but the, the three episodes we talked about are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to our production team. The show is produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye.